afternoon, everybody. My name is Angela Damiani. I'm the CEO of Milwaukee, and I would like to welcome you to Milwaukee's Cloud Cafe presentation of The Shift. Um, this afternoon, I would like to take a moment to thank our series sponsors, the Leader Financial Group and the LAK Group for ensuring the continuity of this important conversation, even amid these uncertain times. Both of these companies are doing many things to ensure gender parity in the workplace and beyond, and we thank you for continuing your support of Milwaukee and our mission of changing the way people connect um, in this new virtual format and reality we're all living in. Um, in today's shift session, we're going to explore how COVID-19 and the shelter-in-place orders have forced us to find a new normal, which has impacted our work and our home lives in new and interesting ways. Someday in the future, millions of us will be able to leave our makeshift home offices and return to our traditional workplaces. The buildings will be the same, but the way we experience work probably won't. Um, after weeks of working virtually, we have new expectations for a work-life blend. Um, organizations have new digital capabilities and many of us have comfort, a new comfort level in working remotely. In the business world, there is a big debate about what will change. Um, today, we're going to hear from speakers about their take on the new normal as well as what it will require um, as uh, this is a new world order that no one has really ha like made a plan for prior to this. Um, to take on this topic, um, I'm happy to welcome several of our guest speakers. Amy Hanneman, the Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion at Northwestern Mutual. Holly Tesca, the Managing Partner at LAK Group. And Clarissa Ortiz, from the Senior Director of Risk, Product, Readiness, and Adoption at Northwestern Mutual. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Amy for writing the description of today's topic. I actually took a, a huge page in a note from a LinkedIn post you recently posted, and I felt like, oh, that's exactly what we need to talk about. Um, and so I appreciate you letting me plagiarize your words and then um, giving us some fodder to really like have a robust conversation. So um, I guess to kick things off, Amy, why don't you start by briefly introducing yourself, your career trajectory, and maybe how you have experienced non-traditional gender roles in the workplace and or your family life? Sure, uh, and by, by all means, I'm glad that you found the article useful and that it's a jumping off point for our conversations. And I know that oh, all of us are talking about this right now. What is, what is the new normal and what do we wanna leave behind? What should we be leaving behind in the past when we do return to work? Um, so for me, I grew up in a pretty traditional household. I had a mom who was a uh, a stay-at-home mom for a little while who also waitressed at night and then went on to become a teacher. So kind of very female roles. And my father was a union electrician and went into IT. Um, what they taught me was that uh, they wanted me to get a job out of college. I had a 401k and that was the most important thing in life. And so that's what I did. I went and I got a job with a 401k and I landed in the most male dominated industries I could possibly land in, starting in aerospace and defense and then in tech. Uh, and now I'm um, with Northwestern Mutual, which anyway, my, my, point, my point is that my, my roles have been informed by tradition. I think, I know now today, what might be different about me is that I'm not only a mom, but a mom to uh, soon to be four young children in a senior level role. And maybe that's a little a traditional, but let's not keep it that way, right? So I think I'll pause there yeah. and let's go to the next one. For sure. Holly, why don't you go next? Thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here with you guys today. Um, as you mentioned, my current role is as a managing principal at LAK Group, where I oversee their executive coaching practice and some leadership development work uh, that we provide to clients. Before that, I spent 
31 years in a similar um, role where I had North American responsibility for an executive coaching practice for a division of Manpower Group. So I've been in this space a long time. Um, I'll tell you that my career, uh, my real career started probably 33 years ago as the receptionist at the, the, the company that I spent 31 years at. And, um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate in that, or maybe unfortunate and fortunate at the same time. You know, my husband and I have been married for 41 years, so I'm not juggling small children at home right now. My kids are raised, but my husband was laid off from his job in 1982, and at that time, we had just had our second, and um, I had been raised in a very traditional family. My original, our thought was that I would be a stay-at-home mom and stay with the kids, but all of a sudden, here he was in a situation where he couldn't find a job, and... Um, so I went back to work full time and I had a little part time job on the side and and he worked um, a third shift job and we really learned a lot about what it means to sit in those opposite gender roles. You know, you think back to 1982, things were still pretty traditional at that point. Um, we would both say that we learned so much. I around what it means to be the primary breadwinner in a family which is big business, putting a roof over the family's head and keeping food in their mouths. He learned that, you know, it's not easy being the one to stay home and make the beds and, and take care of the kids and run them to the doctor's appointments and all those things. So I think early in our relationship, we were able to establish a really good way of communicating and understanding that just because what society was expecting from us, we could, we could bend and mold to whatever the world presented to us. And I think that's probably the biggest secret to us being married and actually still liking each other after 41 years. So, you know, I think I was grateful. I didn't know it at that time uh, when your husband's suddenly out of work and you've got two little ones at home. But I think it was foundational in, you know, how I see gender roles and um, in the workplace and at home today. For sure. And Clarissa, would you mind introducing yourself to us as well? Sure. Hi, everyone. Clarissa Ortiz. First of all, I'm just honored to be here with some really amazing other women uh, who have some great stories to share, too. So like Amy, I also work at Northwestern Mutual. Um, I used to work in media and television, actually, and then switched to financial services about eight years ago after grad school. Um, I grew up in a home, so my, my mother is Puerto Rican and my father is Lithuanian and they're both attorneys. Um, I decided I did not want to go to law school and uh, kind of rebel against my parents because I think they thought there was really two professions in life. It was being a doctor, being a lawyer. Um, and, you know, my mother in particular, well, they both have very fascinating stories, but my mom started practicing law in the Chicagoland area um, at the time when there were very few Hispanic female attorneys. And um, I learned a lot from watching my parents and the struggles that they faced. I mean, my mom faced significant discrimination. She has a very thick accent and, um, you know, I got to, when I mean, she would drag all the four of us to her office on days when we were off of school and it was just sort of the part of our normal. We always saw our parents working um, and uh, I think it, we always had an admiration for my parents and the struggles that they faced and, and what they did to build up their practice. They own their own law firm. Um, so when my husband and I got married and when we had my, our first, um, you know, I, I didn't really think, I mean, I, I considered for maybe five minutes about staying home <laughs> and then I realized it was not for me. Um, you know, we both have pretty demanding careers. I love what I do. My husband does too. In fact, he actually works at Northwestern Mutual as well. We met uh, there years ago. Um, and he actually has a pretty demanding job in the sense that he travels all across the state of Wisconsin, obviously not right now, but, um, you know, so for us, uh, you know, our family's always been our number one priority and our kids are our number one priority, but I think our careers are really important to us and, and matter to us. Um, you know, we, we see it as, um, 
you know, part of a context of other interests and purpose that we have in our life. In fact, uh, right now, since all of us are home and my son, uh, my oldest is two and a half and he's watching us work, he loves to imitate us. And in fact, has started going around the house with his pretend laptop and his cell phone and some headphones. And he tells us that he's working. And, um, you know, while we tease him and we think it's funny now, I think it's really important lessons that um, we're instilling in him and that we're contributing to a broader society and are learning and growing. And we talk all the time about what did he learn today and what did I learn today and what did daddy learn today? Um, and so this, you know, while this new juggle is crazy for us, um, it's really been a blessing in a lot of ways because we've been able to spend more time with our kids and, um, you know, have an op opportunity to watch them just like I was able to watch my parents growing up. Um, and, you know, as far as sharing the load, we, we, we definitely have some untraditional, um, uh, gender roles in our household. So my husband is the cook and he's a fabulous cook. And uh, in a pandemic, when you're cooking all the time, it can be very dangerous because <laughs> we're eating very well. Um, you know, he also does most of the handiwork around the house and, you know, uh, I'm still breastfeeding. So I take on a lot of load as far as, uh, you know, especially feeding my youngest. Um, but it, you know, it, it's all about sharing that load and, um, you know, continuing to flex and continuing to communicate and, um, you know, fortunate enough to have a good partner uh, to go through this craziness with us. For sure. Well, Amy, I think the thing that really stuck out to me about your piece you wrote was that part about authentic, authenticity, right? And so I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, we were all sort of establishing ourselves as uh, you know, contributing members to our family in terms of you know winning bread, and you know being working moms pre-COVID, um, can you speak a little bit about how COVID nineteen has altered your work and your ability to work authentically in the last couple months? Sure. Um, you know, I remember for some reason it makes me think about when I was pregnant with my first child and working full time. Um, I was hesitant to come out with the pregnancy because of the maternal bias that we all know exists. Um, and then after I had the baby, I was hesitant to put a picture of my own family on my desk. And we were talking to a straight cis woman here, you know, uh, and a lot of that has changed. And I bring, I think I bring as much of my authentic self to the office as I've possibly can these days, but things are different now when my coworkers are seeing me in my upstairs makeshift office in my house in a you know bedroom. We ran out to uh, the store right before we knew shutdown was going to hit, went to Ikea, bought a little table, bought a chair, have a makeshift situation so my husband can work in you know his office downstairs it's really dark down there. It's not that he took the office because he's the dude and I got the upstairs bedroom. It's just dark. And this place, this room has lots of windows. Anyway, my point is <laughs> my children streak across the camera half naked. Um, they interrupt all the time. Uh, I don't shower every day. Uh, I don't put on my suit every day. It's chaos, right? For many of us. And that raw humanity that comes through in these video calls all the time, along with the need to work more flexibly if you are caring for a child, caring for an elder, or other things are going on in your life if you're a part of a community that has been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. There's stuff going on and you can't hide it. And so this forced uncovering of the things that are connecting us now through COVID-19 and just reality, that's the authenticity that uh, I think is one of the silver linings of COVID-19, if we can see it that way. And I hope that that forced authenticity, my kids streaking across, whatever, is something that we bring back to the workplace with us. And it's gonna be a challenge because I'm not gonna have a naked kid to walk through the conference room. But people have learned things about me now that they that weren't as visible. So how, and it's been good. So how do I continue to show up as a leader with all of that that makes me who I am and makes me way more approachable and way more relatable to people that I interact with? And how do our other leaders do that too? And not just our leaders, but all of us. We say, bring your whole self to work. Well, we've got an opportunity now to seize on that when we go back to the office. 
That makes a lot of sense. Holly, from your perspective, being an, an empty nester, you know, you, you don't necessarily have a toddler streaking past your video conferences. How has COVID-19 altered your work um, in the You're last- Welcome to have my toddler if you'd like. <laughs> sure, I'll take, I actually have toddler grandkids. Um, <laughs> they're a handful. Um, I've done my duty, ladies, it's your turn. <laughs> but thank you for the offer. Um, you know, it's interesting. So I spent a good portion of my career leading a, um, a virtual team. So working from a home office is not really foreign to me. Um, I probably spent 20 years working from a home office or the road. Um, so that doesn't feel uncomfortable, but my husband and I are both working from home now. That feels a little weird because uh, he's literally 20 feet away from me in our loft space. And, you know, we have this thing, open door, closed door, open door, closed door, open, depends on who's, who is on what call. Um, but, you know, to, to speak to what Amy was talking about, you know, I think the level of authenticity that we're seeing now because we're seeing people as real human beings with real lives that exist outside of the four walls of your office where most people know you. Um, and Amy, you're right. As leaders, I think people trust you more when they realize that you know, to, to take a corny phrase, you pull your pants on the same way as everybody else does, right? And when you are able to be vulnerable and allow people to see that, I think it makes them much more willing and able and motivated to follow you, right? So I think the net net of it all has been extremely positive. Do I miss seeing my coworkers? Because now I do have an office that I can go to. Yes, I absolutely meet the collegiality, um, you know, the little conversations that you have with people in passing. And I think we've tried to fill some of that in through technology. Um, I miss that, but I'm also having much deeper conversations with people just because we're seeing the rawness, the realness that we're all struggling with right now. You know, it's lonely. Yeah, I like my husband a lot, but I'd really like to see some other people. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. I'm wondering, um, Clarissa, how has COVID-19 affected your primary partnership with your husband amid all of this and, and really the roles you each play inside and outside of work? Yeah, so like Amy, I have small uh, two small kids um, as well. Uh, I'm not brave enough to go to four. Um, two is enough for me, uh, but I have two boys, two and a half and nine months, and life is hectic for us. Uh, as I mentioned, my husband and I work full time as well. Um, you know, I, I I guess I'm always been an eternal optimist. So perhaps you know, while this is hard, there are definitely some blessings in all of this. So um, I don't know about any of you, but like the morning scramble was awful. Getting two kids out of the house to get to daycare. And, you know, of course there's always the meltdowns right when you need to leave and you're late for that meeting. Um, I, I'm guilty of actually pumping in the car on the way to work because I knew I wasn't gonna get to work on time. Um, it was hectic before, but ha not having that commute and, um, you know, just like, I just feel like I'm more patient to some degree because I don't have, sure. um, you know, things to get to at a certain time. I mean, obviously I have calls, but I really try to structure my day in such a way where I have some flexibility, especially first thing in the morning and towards the end of the day, because let's face it, I don't care how many times I tell my two and a half year old mom is working upstairs. He's still going to barge in. He still wants his mom. I have two mama's boys and it doesn't matter how much my husband's helping or my mother-in-law who's been helping us. They just sometimes want mom. Um, and, and I love my kids and I love spending more time with my kids. And, um, and so I've really tried to structure my day to not be the traditional eight to five schedule. You know, I'm lighter in the morning and I definitely work a lot at night uh, after the kids go to bed, but that works for me. And, you know, one thing I've learned in this is the importance of um, uh, leaning on your, your support system, like leaning on each other as a partnership, you know, uh, my husband and I, and, you know, we've taken a beating because date nights are nowhere near as fun as they used to be. So we've had to get creative and, and find time for ourselves, but we also have to lean on each other as much as we can and pick each other up when it's hard. 
um, you know, we have our good days and bad days for sure. And our, my two and a half year old especially tests our patients constantly and is always manipulating, I think. Um, so that's one way that we've survived. Um, the other thing too, as far as uh, work partnerships go, um, I've, I've started to learn that it's really important to never assume um, that you know what people are dealing with and what they're struggling with. And even if they have kids, everybody's schedule, their kids' schedules are different. I remember I had a call recently with somebody and at one point during the call, she just kind of broke down and said, I'm really sorry if you hear some background noise. I'm in the closet with my 18 month old trying to keep him occupied while my husband's on a call. And that was a really eye opening experience. I I was shocked, right? And I just said, here I am. I'm supposed to be the one relating to that and empathizing with that. And here I am. I had this call during a time that was so inconvenient for her. And so I've really shifted since then. And I try my best to never assume that a time works for somebody or, you know, and even if you have a meeting at a set time, things happen, right? Like kids are crazy and uh, you always have to be flexible. And so I really tried to ask before just setting up meetings, you know, is this a good time for you or what's the best time of day? Um, you know, and some people are, are shifting their schedules just to, and then there's also kids who have homework at certain times, right? And schoolwork. So, um, you know, you can't assume that you know what people are going through. And I think that's helped me also be a better leader too. Um, you know, so I have a woman that works for me who has three boys as well. So we relate on so many different levels. And there's some times where she just needs to vent because it's been a really bad day. And so we just like pause everything and we just talk. And um, that's really needed right now because personal connection is more challenging. And it's made, I think, me more th authentic leader um, because I can relate to her in so many ways on that level. So um, yeah, it's, I agree with everything that's been shared. This is definitely challenging times, but um, the authenticity is really refreshing too. I think it, it makes us better leaders and better parents. Um, and hopefully some of that will continue post COVID-19. For sure. Amy, I see someone has joined us. Who is the, here? We have a guest speaker. Her name is Susie. She is five. Susie, can you say hi? Hi, Susie. Hi, Susie. <laughs> and, and this is the authenticity that I'm talking about, right? Um, for the first two or three weeks that we were home, um, it was very hard, just the constant, no, 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 shut the door, you can't come in, get out, get out. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, and so I've just let the kids just kind of come in and be a part of the calls. And as long as they're not disruptive, they, they play over in the corner or they sit on my lap. And we've had a lot of opportunities to bond as a family this way. And, and just, just, you gotta let it go. You know, <laughs> you gotta let the seriousness and the, I've gotta be exactly the way I was in the office go. Um, we don't have a choice. We'll break. The right. resiliency will break if we can't just be ourselves in our office right now. Right. And so if you think about that model, that really should apply when we get back to work. Because if you are covering, which is the term that we use in the DNI space all the time, if you are covering something, uh, you're wasting a lot of energy, which turns into lost productivity in the workplace. And so how can we maintain this sense of this is who I am, and these are my people, and this is how it's going to roll and, you know, when we get back to the office. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I just want to tell anyone that's in the, um, the Zoom room with us or on Facebook Live, if you have questions, please feel free to use the chat function to um, join in this dialogue. Um, I have a question, really this can be for any of you. Um, what advice do you have for someone whose career plans um, or path has perhaps been altered amid COVID-19? Obviously not everyone has been as fortunate um, sort of a seamlessly transition into a work, you know, work from home environment, um, or perhaps they've been furloughed. What, what kind of advice do you have for anyone that's sort of needing to turn on a dime right now? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in. Um, one reflection that I've had over the last couple of weeks and months um, has been just how important it is, um, the, the company that you work for and, um, the company's ability to ride through uncertainty, right? Like I, when I, especially early in my career, um, when I was, you know, really ambitious and thinking, you know, I can accomplish anything and to some degree, I guess I still feel that way, but um, there's a lot of things that really matter when you look for a company that uh, you want to work for. And, and I feel fortunate to work for Northwestern Mutual. Um, 
for many reasons right now. One is I think just the financial strength of the company. We've been around for 160 years and we've been through pandemics before. Um, you know, there's not a lot of companies right now that can say that. Um, you know, and then also just the essentialness of our purpose um, and what we do, and that matters, right? Um, in addition to many other things around like, you know, your boss and who you work for, and are you challenged professionally, and do you have opportunities to grow? I mean, that all matters. But I think just the essentialness of the purpose of the company um, really matters. Like right now, for example, you know, so many retailers, unfortunately, are really struggling. And it'll be interesting to see what happens coming out of this as far as what retailers can make it and what innovation can happen through all of this. But you know, fortunate enough to work for a company that has a really essential purpose, which is um, you know, helping clients with financial planning through all sorts of ups and downs. Um, it's also uh, made me realize just the, the nobility and the purpose of the financial planning profession. And so that's definitely something that I would put a plug for if anybody who's considering a, a change in careers to consider financial planning. I think we as women are very uniquely suited for that type of role because um, you know, we see a lot of connections. We can relate to people on so many different levels through ups and downs. Uh, my husband, when this first started, my husband was uh, reminding me daily about how much money we had lost in the stock market. And I always continue to remind him about the bigger picture, right? And putting it in the context of our goals in the future. And so I think that, you know, is another reason why we balance each other out perhaps, but um, definitely would put a plug for that type of profession. But um, yeah, I've worked in, you know, media um, in the past and media is a uh, challenge right now too. And and so um, it's definitely been something that I've learned through all of this. It's just, you know, remind yourself of what type of company do you want to work for? And that, and that matters. Not to say that we're immune to anything at Northwestern Mutual, but, um, you know, we certainly have the ability to ride some things out. So I feel fortunate for that. Um, the other thing I would just add to that is uh, tap into your resources right now as much as you can. And I think that requires us to get a bit creative um, because we can't see people face to face. You can't just pick up the phone and meet somebody for coffee, right? Like networking is totally different. Um, so you have to be really intentional about that. And it does make it more challenging, um, you know, as you're starting to think about a changing career. So um, I think that's just another thing that we'll have to keep in mind as you're considering a shift in career. Holly, I know this is a big part of what LAK Group does. Do you want to tell us what kind of advice you have from your perspective about folks whose career plans are maybe upended at the moment? Absolutely. Thank you so much for asking. I was going to just jump in after Clarissa. So yes, um, a big part of LAK Group's business is the outplacement world. So, you know, currently we're working with many individuals who have been displaced, um, you know, because of uh, downsizing, right sizing, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, you know, it's tough times. I mean, we are all looking at the numbers. Um, you know, unemployment, what did they say last week? 14.7%, you know, really unprecedented times. But, you know, the flip side to that is people are still landing jobs every single day, right? And it's an opportunity, number one, to step back and reflect, you know, am I really doing what I want to do? Do I see this as an opportunity to maybe make a, a pivot um, in my career? So I would encourage people to, you know, take the time to really do the, the work, the reflection, understand what makes you happy, what motivates you, find that that spot that really is a good fit. And if you need help with that, reach out to, to get it, right? I think the other thing that people are really recognizing is how important it is to use the tools that are available to you, right? So for those of us that have been on LinkedIn for a while, we know the value of making connections that way, of having a social presence of, um, you know, so it's not like the vo there's a huge, a total emptiness right now when you can't pick up the phone, call somebody and say, hey, let's grab coffee, right? There are different ways to get connected. So, you know, people should be taking some of this downtime, some of this pause, which quite honestly, I've sort of appreciated, you know, it's, it's been a crazy time, but it's also been a very reflective time for me as I think about and work with clients that are, you know, questioning, you know, what will the world look like post COVID? What role do I wanna be playing in a post COVID world? How can I be um, putting plans together now to be able to, to achieve my dreams and you know, take part in the world the way that I wanna see it evolve from this? It's been a tough time. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been doing the same thing is really, really thinking about 
you know, taking the opportunity to lift up every piece of my life, whether it's personal or professional, and, and to just look at it and to decide, is this something I want to continue and to move forth? Um, you know, I think it, it, is, um, it is a position of privilege. I feel really, really present and grateful for the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm not struggling to put food on the table, and so I can take this as a moment to really reflect. But I think there's a responsibility in that as well to really think about who do you want to be, how do you want to show up in the world. Um, when no one would blame you for having some sort of like nuclear meltdown, but um, mm -hmm. you know the, the other thing is that no one will blame you if you come out looking different on this the other side. So how is it that you want to show up as an employer? Um, how is it that you want to show up for your teams? How is it that you want to show up as a leader? And I, I've, I've really appreciated the opportunity to have this moment of reflection and then to make some conscious decisions about where things may need to shut off or to start anew um, in whatever the next reality really looks like. Um, to your point, Amy, about um, the flexibility that's needed, somebody asked in the Q&A, um, how might you go about asking for that in the future, right? So I know that um, some employers have been really, really easily responsive um, to like affording that. And I think you mentioned that, you know, Twitter has decided they're all gonna go um, home, you know what I mean, work from home in perpetuity now. If your employer is not necessarily um, offering that as a solution, how might you advocate for yourself in that way moving forward? Yeah, that's a tough one. I think um, one of the issues that many companies have had with flexibility is that they've put out these statements or these blanket policies that say we have a flexible work uh, environment. So embrace flexibility, managers and employees, and work it out between yourselves um, to suit your needs as an individual as well as the business. And that's great. That's a wonderful framework. It's very open-ended and people can do with it what they need to based on their lives and their schedules, but people are afraid to ask. And we're not having these conversations like we should. And we're not bringing the asks to the table in, our, in candid conversations with our leadership and with our companies to express the needs that we do have. And that's one of the reasons why we don't see flexible policies adopted as much as they should be. Um, so that goes back to the whole thing we were talking about earlier about authenticity and trying to really be more open and honest and candid and transparent with who you are and what your needs are as a person. And that requires what? Courage. And so just like it's courageous for me to have Susie on the call, or you know, honestly, I don't think it's courageous, but maybe some would look at it that way. It's just life, right? How do I bring that life and that need that I have for flexibility into my conversation with my leader so that he or she knows what I knows what I need first of all and I can communicate that and even have have a hope of a conversation so before we you know before we get upset about policy or lack of policy which i do agree companies need to use this as a moment to go way further with flexible work arrangements i think it's on all of us to have courage to have those conversations in the first place and put our needs out there in front and it's also on leaders especially to welcome those conversations and encourage their employees to ask for what they need so that would be that would be where i'd start with that yeah I think that there's um, there's also some relics hanging around from the Industrial Revolution yet, right? I mean, where managers are a bit uncomfortable not seeing people in their in their seats, you know, um, and some mindsets that you know I know we've fought against this for years and years and years, but sitting at a desk and doing and and putting in your time does not necessarily equate to productivity, right? And we need to continue to help leaders, managers in the organizations that are uncomfortable not having that direct oversight. We have to help them become more comfortable in, in knowing how to measure productivity and whether their people are really engaged. You're right, Amy. I think it requires trust and, and courage on the part of the individual to express what their needs are. I also think we need to continue to bolster managers around understanding that those are important conversations 
And the answer isn't automatically no. It should be, well, it depends on how do we figure this out. Yeah, that makes absolutely a ton of sense. Um, and I think, I think your point about self-advocating is a big, a big deal. And it, it, it can be a, that can be a flex unto itself, right? Like if you don't feel comfortable um, or you haven't had to advocate for yourself in the past, know that you have the autonomy to do that as a, uh, an employee, right? Now, sometimes it's going to be no, you don't always get every single thing you want. Um, but, but you can't, um, you can't get a yes if you never ask for it, right? Um, someone asked, um, what advice do you have for a young professional who is hoping to start a family now at this point in her career, but with the uncertainty of the job market is unsure if it's the best time to do so? Um, and as a secondary thing, would it be challenging to apply for new jobs while pregnant? Um, I, I'll just speak from my own pers uh, perspective on that. I had a baby on New Year's Eve um, four months ago, um, and I was just saying this morning, um, what are your plans for us, little girl? Like, why did you decide to come right now amid this like insane moment? Um, and that's perhaps just a reflection of my own like spiritual belief that like, you know, we're kismically and destined to be a mother daughter relationship. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, uh, personally feel like a couple things. One is don't forget it takes 10 months to make a baby. They say nine months, but it's 40 weeks. That's 10 months. And so, um, you know, it, and you don't always get it on the first shot either. So, you know, yeah. it, it doesn't hurt to start trying. And I think, you know, the best advice I ever got because I, I own my own company um, and I got married a little bit late and I remember asking my own mother this, like, I feel pressure to get started, but you know, is there a right time? And she said, you know, at some point in your life, things don't go in chronological order. It's not like first you do middle school and then you do high school and then you do college and you get a job. At some point, all the trains leave the station at the same time and it's a messy, chaotic, loud moment of your life, but it's, it's a joyful one too. And while I don't think you should um, uh, not be present to the like financial ramifications of starting your family while growing your career, I, I do, speaking from very personal advice, find this to be um, just the most intense and wonderful experience to be doing all of this and also be mothering very small children. Um, so that's just my own individual perspective. I'm, I'm wondering for the three of you, um, especially in your um, individual uh, experiences this, with this, what are your perspectives on getting started with your family and or um, what is it like to apply for a job if you are pregnant? Yeah, I've I got to jump in on this one because I mentioned working in male dominated industries. And so when I worked, gosh, I was at Raytheon for many, many years. And then I got an opportunity to come to Hewlett Packard and I applied for the job. And in my interview, I told them I'm pregnant with my first baby and you can't have me right now. And if you want me, you're going to have to wait. Basically was a conversation. And of course, I didn't say it like that, but I had a choice to make. Do I out myself with my pregnancy and let them know why they would need to wait a little bit? Or did I try to, to cover it? And I said, you know what? I don't work, for, I don't want to work for a company that's not going to take me as I am. Yeah. Um, and so they hired me. And it was a wonderful experience. And you know, and then now here I am at Northwestern Mutual, who has fully embraced me with the three children, young children that they knew I had during the interview process as I came to work for Northwestern Mutual just a little bit over a year ago. And now they're fully supporting me through my, my fourth pregnancy, the baby's due at the end of September. There's no issue at all. I mean, I'm gonna go out for a little while and then I'll be back. And so the advice that I have to younger women who are in that, you know, do I now or do I later, never put your life streams on hold for a company or a job. Yes. Try to, try to pick good companies and good leaders that will support you through it, right? But regardless, jobs are going to come and go. Um, you should go after what you know you want in your heart when the time is right for you. I guarantee it'll work out. And if their current situation, it feels like it doesn't, the job or the boss is not supportive, you'll find a way through it. Resiliency is the key. 
and always coming back to your core of what's most important to you and what you want out of your life. You keep that in your periphery and you'll continue to steer in the direction of, of, what you're, of what you want for your life. So do it. I couldn't agree more. And I actually went through some of this last year. I um, actually interviewed for a job when I was eight months pregnant. And then I interviewed for another job when I was breastfeeding. Um, and, uh, so I'll maybe just share, and then that was actually before I took this role. Um, so when I interviewed for the job, when I was eight months pregnant, I remember telling my husband, you know, I think I'm going to bring a shawl and just kind of cover up a little bit because <laughs> clearly I'm visibly very pregnant. And he said, why are you doing that? Why would you do that? Like, be proud of who you are. You were eight months pregnant and you're a mother. And like, I think he, um, it was just a great cheerleader in that moment. It just reminded me like, this is who I am. And yes, I'm very pregnant. And if God forbid that they made a decision based on that, like shame on them. And sh I wouldn't want to work for that leader anyway. Right. So you've got to just, um, I know it's hard, right. Cause, um, you know, it, it's a big, it's a challenging, um, transition in your life, but I've found, uh, that when I take on more and I just lean into things, you'd be surprised where, where, where you come out on the other side. And actually I ended up um, getting another opportunity. Um, well, actually while I was on maternity leave and I ended up interviewing for that role, I ended up turning it down um, and then actually uh, took on this role, which came about um, kind of in a weird happenstance way um, shortly thereafter. But I remember when I was um, interviewing, they told for the second role, they told me that it was going to be four and a half hours of interviews. And I had to stop and say, okay, how am I going to tell them that I can't go four and a half hours without mommy? <laughs> and how am I going to bring that up? And I, I just brought it up and I said, look, here's my deal. And they were so super accommodating and wonderful. Um, and again, I think, um, you know, to Amy's point, like, you know, companies really, um, you'd be surprised. Like so many companies have really uh, changed the way that they think about things. And there's so many women in the workplace right now um, that, you know, companies have to be accommodating for one legally. And second of all, um, they want to be a company that people want to work for. And, and yes, there are plenty of leader, terrible leaders out there and plenty of terrible companies out there, but you'd be surprised if you just lean in what, what comes out of it. And so for me, I ended up um, taking on a different role uh, and actually it was a promotion and a bigger responsibility all while having two small kids at home. And I remember it was actually a woman who told me, who asked me, why are you doing that right now in your life with two small kids? Like you're, you're crazy, you know? And again, I just came back to, um, I, in, in times of chaos is when we grow the most, right? And I love the job that I'm in and I love my kids and yes, life is crazy, but I've learned a ton both personally and professionally. And I'm fortunate enough to work for a really great leader who supports me and understands what I'm going through. So my advice uh, for somebody who's in that, that point in their career and, and that point in their life, you know, just lean into it um, and you'd be surprised what comes out on the other side. Um, and how you'll grow from that experience. And sure, it will be crazy and challenging. Um, you know, I don't mean to say that I don't have meltdowns and you know, I'm so sleep deprived all the time, but you know, it's, it's just reality and it's my world. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm loving the job that I'm in and I love my little family. Yeah, I will say if you like sleep, you should maybe reconsider a uh, motherhood. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> you'll never sleep again. No, and just no, when you no, get no. your kid to no, sleep, no, no, then no. they go don't, through sleep regression. <laughs> don't scare people. No, that's not what this is about. <laughs> we are amazingly resilient people. And, yes. and that's true. You, you can be a VP of a company and not sleep. That's the point. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I actually find that I am my most productive sometimes when the kid wakes up in the middle of the night and I can't go back to sleep. And instead of just you know, sitting there yep. frustrated and wanting to cry, I'll get up and be productive for a couple hours. You, you know... You can't catch up on sleep. Yes, there is sleep deprivation, but you just you figure it out and you keep going yeah. and you make it work for you. For sure. And there's always caffeine and wine too, whenever you need yeah. it. <laughs> um, well, I, I have one final question for you and I'd love to have you each answer. Um, what is one new routine you have established during the sheltering in place that you hope you don't lose when life goes back to normal? Holly, do you wanna go first? So um, at, at the office, we've established, um, because we're a small team, about a dozen people, we've established a morning huddle call every morning at eight o'clock, which is just a time for us all to kind of come together and get connected. You know, it's been really nice. You know, uh, it, we, in the chaos of what typically goes on, um, 
it, in every day, it kind of grounds us all, gets us started, and it's yeah, you know, sometimes it's business related things we're talking about. Other times we're we're sharing funny things that happen to us personally, whatever. But it's been a really good experience. So I'm hoping that that doesn't go away. Um, you know, you guys are going to want to kick me because you're you're sleep deprived moms. You will trust me. Someday you will have a chance to nap again. I promise you, there will be naps in your future. Um, <laughs> but the one thing I really have been appreciating is sleeping in just a little bit later in the morning because I don't have to, because I don't have a commute. And that's been really nice. And sometimes I'm awake already, but it's just nice to lay there and kind of get yourself together for the day and think about, you know, what, it's not as crazy. And I'm really, really appreciating that. And I, I really hope that that continues. What about you, Amy? Sorry, coming off a of mute there because someone was screaming downstairs and you, nobody needs to hear that, <laughs> although it's surely authentic. <laughs> um, but they didn't sound like they died or anything. So I think because <laughs> you know, moms, we can tell the difference between the scream Absolutely. and the scream. Right. Um, the fake cry, too. Can't forget yeah, that. Yeah. So <laughs> I know I, I, this should be a lighthearted hard, conversation, and, and I don't mean to take us in a, in a, in a deeper place, but I, I can't help but go there. I think the authenticity includes uh, removing apathy around things that we just either have pretended like we don't see, or maybe that we didn't see. And that extends to how we use our privilege. So how we use our privilege in the workplace, that can be around how are we really focusing on sponsoring others and mentoring others and helping them, especially other women, to lift up and to have visibility. That can be allyship, you know, it can be busting bias. And, you know, what does it mean for the parents that have been working with and while trying to balance young children or elder care or whatever it is, um, will there be bias against them from a productivity standpoint at the end of this year that won't be applied to people who didn't have the same circumstances that they're dealing with? You know, we as leaders and managers and people need to be aware of what's everyone's unique circumstance and what's happening today and how that might be affecting them. And we cannot be apathetic to it. And then also, you know, I think COVID-19 has shed a lot of light on disparity outside the walls of our companies. And so how are we each being non-apathetic, especially our white community, to the needs of our brothers and sisters who are disproportionately impacted by racism right now? You know, and so how do we how do we remain eyes open, goggles off, blinders off to what's happening in this new authentic world that we're trying to create when we do go back back to work? Thank you. That's a beautiful message. Clarissa, do you have anything else you'd like to add? The perfect message. I'll just quickly say, um, so we all, as if for those of us that are parents have had that moment um, in all the craziness, uh, there's always those sweet moments, right? And I had one of those last night. Um, uh, I, my son, um, of course, as soon as he came home from school uh, during the pandemic, um, just totally rebelled. We were doing potty training and everything, all hell broke loose. Um, and so we had to, a couple weeks ago, put him back on a really strict schedule throughout the day. And we kind of baked in uh, certain times where he has one-on-one -on -one time with mom and one-on-one -on -one time with dad. And so one tradition that we started, my son and I, is after I shut down at the end of the day and after I've put my youngest to bed, him and I have 45 minutes of just quality time, just the two of us. And it could be going for a walk or reading books or whatever it may be. And last night we chose to go for a walk. And um, while we were walking, he just looked at me at one point, he's two and a half. And he said, mama, I love you. And he's never said that to me before, um, you know, unscripted or unprompted. And I just, I just lost it. Right. And um, it was such a sweet moment and such an authentic moment. And um, one tradition that I hope to continue is having like really intentional time with my kids because right now, you know, there, there's more time with your kids, right? Um, but once we go back into the hustle and bustle of the commutes and everything else, you have to be more purposeful. And it's usually a scramble to get kids fed, right? And kids to bed and it's awful. And you're so not the best mom, you know? And um, 
so it's like you have to take a step back and just remind yourself of finding those intentional times, uh, you know, where you're less stressed and just patient and listening to your kids um, and, and cherish those moments because they're so few and far between. Um, and it was just a great reminder of like how valuable that one-on-one -on -one time is with my son, especially now that I have, I have to spread my arms across two kids and usually I'm, I'm with the baby. Um, especially since I'm breastfeeding. So he really needs it and values it and appreciates it. And I know um, it, it'll, it's just very important, regardless of whether or not we're in a pandemic or not. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for being so real during this conversation. I really, I just appreciate, um, and I've said it a million times, but how authentic you each showed up to this conversation. I think it's absolutely critical that we be this transparent about what the opportunities have, um, you know, been afforded to us as well as the challenges that, that are each in front of us trying to navigate this new normal. Um, I do want to actually um, welcome Matt Leader from Leader Financial Group to just say a couple things to close us out. He's um, a, um, a major sponsor of this series. And Matt, thank you so much for um, giving us the opportunity to continue this dialogue uh, remotely. Yeah, thank you, Angela. And Amy, Holly, and Clarissa, thank you for giving of your time. Uh, you, you all did an awesome job today. And thank you for letting me uh, listen in today. I was supposed to kick this off. And then as technology works, I couldn't get my technology uh, to work. So Angela, thanks for your flexibility. But yeah, my name is Matt Leader. And I'm the managing partner of the Leader Financial Group of Northwestern Mutual here in Milwaukee. And um, we're excited to be a partner with Milwaukee on this great event. Uh, we'll be sponsoring these throughout the year. And one of the things that stood out to me today, I, I heard a few different times male dominated industries, and obviously I'm a male. Um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is changing our industry in financial services. So we have historically been a male dominated industry. In fact, somebody told me recently, they said, Matt, your industry is male, pale, and stale. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked in the mirror and I realized, you know, we haven't had much sun, so I'm, you know, male, pale, and stale. And I said, you know what, I want to change that. So our, our vision with, uh, within our firm is to have half of our advisors by 2025 uh, be female. And uh, so that's something I'm passionately pursuing with our team. And that's why we're, we're so excited to sponsor this. One of the follow-ups we'll have for everybody that, that attended this uh, webinar today is the opportunity to do an assessment and learn a little bit more about yourself and understand, are you in the right role? Are you with the right company? And if there's anything our firm can do, I spend all, well, I spend the majority of my time career advising now instead of financial advising. So I would love to have conversations to help people. If you don't think you're necessarily in the right fit, the right role, the right company, our firm would love to engage with you. So you'll get that follow up, you know, after the webinar today. And thanks again for letting me join in. And uh, we're, we're proud to partner with you, Angela in Milwaukee on this. Thanks for your leadership, Matt. You are truly changing the game. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Well, thank you to Leader Financial Group. Thank you to LAK Group. Thank you to all three of these amazing panelists. Um, just a quick plug that for um, uh, women and non-binary individuals who are looking to get a little bit more from um, you know, an accountability standpoint, we have developed a new program called the Rev Collective, where you will be paired with other individuals who have similar aspirations and dreams, and you'll be trained on a practice that allows you to experience radical vulnerability um, with that group of, of peers who will help you sort of find your way towards realizing those goals. So I encourage you to check out revcollective.com if you're looking for a bit more. Um, and then just note that Milwaukee has pivoted all of its programs to, to this Cloud Cafe series, and there is a ton on the lineup, so go to Nuwaki.com if you would like to continue to have this and other really important uh, conversations while we are socially distanced. So thank you all for your support, and we will see you all soon. Stay safe. Thanks for having us.